Yes, so um, welcome back to Politics Snaps. We're, it's, we've got a great guest today. We've got um, Leo Kurse, who is a, a comedian, a writer, um, also has stood as a political candidate recently in, in the Scottish Parliament elections. So say, I mean, thank you so much for your time. It's great to have you. Um, I think a good place to start would be on the, the Scottish nationalism issue. Um, so obviously at the moment, Sturgeon has got into a big fight with Andy Burnham over going to Manchester and banning people going to Manchester. Uh, whilst Manchester, I, I'm told, has a lower rate and lower COVID infection rate than some parts of Scotland. Um, I mean, does that surprise yeah. you that, that she's making a big issue of that? No, it doesn't at all, because uh, Sturgeon, I mean, all, every, all the cards fall in Sturgeon's favour. You know, anything bad that happens in Scotland, she can blame on Westminster, and anything good that Westminster does, like the vaccine rollout, she can take credit for. So, you know, everything lies in Sturgeon's favour, but she can still hoof the ball into her own net by, uh, by you know, putting on these travel bans to, to nor the north of England, which is obviously somewhere that's, you know, quite ideologically and socially aligned with what's called, and there's a lot of yeah. uh, love between the two places. Uh, and Andy Burnham's, you know, incredibly popular in Scotland, so, so Sturgeon can make an enemy uh, of somebody, you know, who should be an ally uh, very easily. And like you say, like you say, the, the, uh, the COVID rates are, are lower in, uh, in Manchester, in the northwest of, of England, than they are in, say, Dundee. Yeah. So I don't know why she's not putting a travel ban. I mean, a, you don't really need to put a travel ban on Dundee. Nobody wants to go to Dundee anyway. I, but, they're, um, they're, I, I heard there's talks. So it's interesting you say that about um, Burnham, because obviously he's kind of like, he's often talked about as a future Labour leader. Um, if yeah. they get rid of Starmer, which, you know, may be happening depending on what happens in, in the upcoming by-election. I mean, do you think that would make a difference in Scotland if they had Burnham? It would, would he connect better? To be honest, I mean, um, Starmer is quite, I, I think, I mean, I'm speaking, speaking to myself and my own perception, but I think Starmer is quite a popular leader uh, in Scotland. I mean, he's, he's got the whole sort of woke thing going on, but he's also got a sort of veneer of competency, which is something that's been missing from the Labour Party for some time now. You know, Jeremy Corbyn, for all that, you know, if, if you're a hardcore communist, anarchist, green fringed, wokeist, he's going to be, you know, you're just going to be salivating over Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, he obviously... You know, couldn't run to the shops and buy a Mars bar, never mind run a country. So um, Starmer, at least, you know, he, he's got that plausibility. I'd, I'd, I'd vote for, I'd potentially vote for Starmer, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, so Burnham, I think, also has that, has that sort of uh, plausibility, but also has maybe more of a sort of authenticity about him. Yeah. Um, Starmer seems very focus group tested. Um, and all, all his stuff, you know, all his stuff, even taking the knee seems seems contrived, but also his attempts to sort of win back the red wall seem very contrived. Yeah. So um, Burnham seems to be, you know, he's more of a, a natural, authentic politician, which I think would play well in Scotland. I mean, politics in Scotland seems quite interesting in that nationalism is seen as progressive. So, I mean, in, in England, waving the flag is, you know, reactionary and bigoted. And, so, <laughs> um, and, and in Scotland, it seems to be the other way around. I mean, how, how did that kind of like come about? How, how, how do we get progressive nationalism? Well, I can tell you how it came about. But I mean, first off, it <laughs> blows my mind. It blows my mind. Like, how can nationalism be progressive? All yeah. across Europe, we've got the rise of this small-minded, parochial, xenophobic nationalism. You're seeing it across, you know, Hungary, Poland. Uh, you saw it in, in England with the, the BNP, and now it's happening in Scotland with the SNP. But for some reason, the Scottish nationalism is seen as, like, woke and progressive, yeah. uh, which it isn't. It's, it's, hor it's a horrible sort of, you know, small-minded, oh, we are the best, you know, and, and hating on your, your neighbours, hating on the English. Uh, so it's, it's a really toxic horrible self-defeating uh, narrative that nationalists push. But I can tell you why it happened is, is because um, England is, is seen as this, you know, ho horrible oppressor, this, you know, empire-building colonialist oppressor. It's the straight white man of countries. So <laughs> anybody, anybody that's criticising it, standing against it, is, you know, is, is a hero. You know, see, Scotland is, you know, waving a flag against against these colonialist oppressors yeah. and obviously you know that narrative is, is, is complete bollocks i mean Eng england's you know very similar to scotland you know ideologically and culturally uh and i think the a real shame uh like scotland used to have such a powerful voice in in the uk like so many prime ministers and politicians i worked in policing i worked in government and in the creative arts when i say creative arts it's comedy so it's, it's just dicking about but, um, you know, I've worked in all these industries in London, 
And there's so many Scots all the way through, all the way through government, all the way through the civil service, you know, everywhere, running, running the UK with a much, you know, considering the size of Scotland compared to the UK, you know, a much bigger voice than, than we should have proportionally. Yeah. And we're losing that now because, you know, it's Sturgeon and the SNP, they're, they're trying to pull people back within, within the borders. So, you know, they bribe Scottish uh, young people to, to stay in Scotland. They pay their fees if they stay in Scotland and study in Scotland. So Scottish youngsters don't cross the border and study in England and find out that, you know, we're all pretty much the same and, you know, we're all one country. Um, and instead, they, you know, they have this small-minded parochial attitude and it, it foments this, uh, this really sort of toxic nationalism. I mean, do you find it weird how there's a lot of I mean, English liberals um, who, you know, if you wave a Union Jack, they, they immediately think you're you're dangerous, you're far right. But they have a, very, a bit of a soft spot for Scottish nationalism. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know if it's just because of Brexit and they're so pissed off at Brexit that anything that gets back at the Brexiteers is sort of seen as a good thing. <laughs> um, but, I mean, do you think there's like some naivety amongst kind of English liberals about what, what actually they're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't expect... Uh, English liberals or liberals anywhere to behave with any sort of logic or reason, to be honest. You know what I mean? I mean, look look at transgender sports. They're all like, you know, they're, they're standing up for the rights of biological males to crush the skulls of uh, biological females. And they think they're being, you know, woke progressives. Man, if that's woke, pro- I will, let's see. Let's see what's woke and progressive in 10 years' time. Because I bet it's not fucking that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, these... This is the thing, the wokeism, you know, progresses and the narrative shifts all the time. The, you know, what's considered a good idea yeah. shifts all the time. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. But basically, English liberals, you know, they, they just, they hate um, what they perceive to be Western colonialist oppression, uh, which is, you know, centered around America, the UK, uh, Israel to a certain extent. So, you know, they've got this, this weird sort of self-loathing as, as countries. They can't be, you know, proud of their country and all the good things it's, it's done. Because, I mean, the, the UK, for all, for all the UK's faults and for all the, you know, we've done terrible things in the past, we've also done amazing things, not just industrially and technologically, but also in terms of, you know, human rights and, um, you know, developing, you know, court systems, judicial systems, systems of governance that, that allow... allow the civilian population to, to be free, to be free people, uh, which is you know, wonderful. Um, so, so yeah, basically English liberals hate their own country, hate their heritage and just want to shit in it. And I don't really understand why. And they see, you know, Scottish nationalism, that's, that's something that's, that's trying to, you know, break free of this, uh, you know, evil colonialism. So, so they support that. Yeah. But I don't understand why. Scotland, Scotland is so much better off in the United Kingdom. We get like 14 billion pounds a year for free. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, Scotland's not a big place. That's like a million pound each probably. You know what I mean? That's, uh, there's only about 20 of us. Yeah, I mean, I, I just find it so weird that um, it, it seems like, you know, that they're already, what, the, the human species is divided into what, 100 and I don't know how many countries. But I mean, if your top goal is to divide into one more country, how the fuck is that progressive? I just don't get it at all. Um, yeah, you know, you know when you go and buy, you go and buy someone on the internet and ask what country you're from, and you click on that list, and it scrolls. Now it scrolls down to yeah. like an infinity of countries. You know, I mean, we need the Cold War back. We don't need Scotland leaving <laughs> and making a new country. We need the Cold War back so the Soviet Union start hoovering up some of these excess countries again. Yeah, you know, I just love it if it was like just three. You know, like, like in 1984, like, like George Orwell world, world. Oceania. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be simpler. Definitely, they, yeah, they always look at the negatives. They always look at the negatives of totalitarian states. <laughs> but one of the positives is far fewer countries to scroll, scroll through. Bring back the Roman Empire. The that's, that's what it's coming yeah, to. You never, you never know. You never know where you're going to be. It could be Britain. It could be Great Britain. <laughs> it could be the United Kingdom. It could be UK. You know, I've got like about five different like alphabet letters I've got to check. <laughs> Obviously, the SNP, they fell short of majority. They fell one short of majority in the Scottish Parliament elections. But with the support of the Greens, they do still have a majority to push through another independence referendum, which they're obviously going to do. Do you think they'll get anywhere with that? Do you think it will happen? Um, to be honest, I don't trust the SNP to, to hold a fair referendum in Scotland. Uh, I think there'll be vote rigging, um, and this will probably get me thrown into the Scottish gulags, uh, which, if anything, are going to be colder than the Siberian gulags. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're trying all the tricks. They're trying to stop uh, Scots from voting in the, in the referendum if, if they're going to vote for um, vote to remain. Yeah. Um, so me, as a Scot living in London, because uh, I've moved back to London now, uh, I wouldn't be allowed, under the current rules, I wouldn't be allowed to vote in the referendum, even though Scotland's, you know, been my home for most of my life. Uh, it's, it's, you know, where I was born. It's uh, where I'm registered for, you know, various financial things, you know, like all these things. I wouldn't be allowed to vote in it. And, like, the, the, the thing is, the, the Scots who've left Scotland and, like, live in the UK, we're the ones who've got the most informed opinion. We've lived amongst, you know, English and Welsh and northern irish people and we know you know what they're like we understand we're all pretty much the same you know what i mean there's not yeah. there's not a huge amount of difference and english people are nice and they love scottish people uh, sturgeon doesn't want us doesn't want the informed people who've left the country to be allowed to vote even though british expats are allowed to vote in brexit yeah yeah I mean, someone put it to me i'm not sure this is literally true but i think it might be but um under kind of sturgeon's rules a scottish soldier who joins the british army and serves abroad can't vote, but a 16 year old got in prison can. <laughs> and he sort of yeah, can, yeah, yeah. So or, or vote. somebody or somebody who's just immigrated to Scotland can uh, can vote. Yeah. So but, yeah. I mean obviously obviously the SNP are trying to encourage as much you know immigration to, to Scotland as, as they can, which you know, which obviously Scotland, you know, as a demographically it needs immigration because yeah. we've got a you know rapidly aging population. Uh, so we need you know fresh blood coming in. Um but, uh, but I mean, it, I think too much immigration, this is what people don't understand, too much immigration can, can really sort of fuel the far right. You can't have too much social change. I mean, look at Brexit only happened because we had that, you know, there's 350,000 uh, people emigrating into the UK every year. Um, so not that I'm saying that Brexit is far right or anything. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, has, it has an impact. It has an impact on social cohesion. Um, and I think you know, unless that's ameliorated, it can it can really sort of you know drive drive the, the far right. So even though left wing governments are always try and in, increase immigration as much as possible because they know that immigrants are, are going to vote for them, or certainly first generation immigrants are going to vote for them, um, I think it can it can backfire. Yeah, I mean, go back to twenty fourteen. Makes sense to say what what you're saying about um, kind of well rigging elections. So the twenty fourteen referendum. Um, obviously, you had sixteen, seventeen years could vote, which at the time I don't think was even the norm for Scottish parliament elections. It, I mean, it, it is now. Um, you had Scots living outside Scotland couldn't vote, and you had a question which was set with a yes no answer. And most political scientists say that gives you about two percent of the vote. I mean, because. David Cameron wants to do exactly the same with the Brexit referendum. He wanted to have a yes, no, with, with yes being remain in the EU. And that yeah. was struck down. But I mean, at, at the time, the Unis just sort of went, well, whatever. I mean, do you think there's a lot of Unis kind of complacency? Like they, they didn't really, they, they thought it would be like a walk in the park. They thought they'd smash the SNP. Um, and yeah. so they, they let the SNP set the terms, basically. And, and, and they shouldn't do that again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't understand. It's the same with, with Brexit. I mean, David Cameron was so overconfident. You know, he didn't. He didn't like you know put so many things in place like like the the yes no question you know he didn't he, and they, every argument I saw from the Remain camp was like oh well car exports will be down by 0.7 percent over three years it's yeah. like man how is that appealing to anybody's heart you know what I mean referendums are always like bad, fought for you know by people's hearts yeah. um, but yeah, uh, sorry. What was what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, do, do you think Unis were were a bit naive in 2014 not to um, sort of fight harder over the rules? Yeah, I mean the, the trouble is that unionists, you know, aren't single issue parties, yeah. and this is you know the strength that the that the Brexit camp had and the strength that the SNP have, because uh, the SNP are basically UKIP, um, but for Scotland, um, even if they don't see themselves. Is that that's that's what they are, and Farage even you know went to Scotland and you know observed what the SNP were doing uh, as a, as a model for for UKIP. Um, so yeah, the unionists are sort of scattered across you know various disparate parties um, and not coordinated and not you know being pro union has never been there's there's never been a it's not like the pro union parties are have pro-union as their core thing. It's like they're the Tories. So the SNP 
he have got that, that advantage of having that you know single issue wedge to drive into to drive into politics. But then they're not thinking about what's what's going to happen after you know they've sort of sold this dream to the Scottish people. Oh, this is what independence is going to be like. It's going to be this fantasy land of you know unicorns. We're going to be like Sweden, but with you know all the, <laughs> with palm trees and you know giraffes and stuff. And it's like no. You're you're going to be like Scotland, but with zero economy, and uh, and instead of being run by you know a fairly transparent government, a uh, fairly transparent and fairly competent government, uh, you're going to be run by the SNP, who are basically a mafia. Yeah, I mean, I was shocked in the Salmond affair. I mean, as I say, you know, I, I live in, in England. I don't pay that much attention to Scottish Parliament mm. um, affairs. I was shocked by just how much of a stranglehold the SNP seemed to have on Scottish political life. And just how much of a stranglehold Sturgeon had on the SNP. It seemed like a really authoritarian way of doing it. I mean, you know, her, her, her husband being basically the, the second most important person in the party. Um, yeah. and, and the way that they kind of like de facto kicked out or demoted anyone that stands up to them. Um, and and you, yeah. combine, you combine that with the fact that they spent the last two, three years trying to overturn not one but two referendum results. And you do sort of go, like, what's their attitude to democracy? Is, is there something we should be worried about here? Yeah, and you can see with uh, with things like the um, Salmon, uh, they're using sort of wokeism uh, to to push their political agenda. So in the wake of the Me Too movement, um, they they changed the ministerial code so that ministers could be uh, could be arrested and charged, or not arrested and charged, but you know charged under the ministerial code for misdeeds that they did, you know, while they were ministers, even after they'd left office. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, as soon as they change that, they change that to, to go after Salmon. I mean, that's certainly what Salmon says um, and you know, it certainly seems to stand up as, as a fact. Um, so they changed the ministerial code to go after Salmon. And um, I mean, the, the trouble is I can't really discuss it without uh, without breaching sure, the sure. law, contempt of court. You know what I mean? But basically, you know, if, if we're to believe Salmon, which, you know, I've got, you know, it's it's credible. It makes sense. You know, having worked in policing, having worked in criminal intelligence, you always look for a motive, and uh, you look for evidence. And there's a motive, and there's evidence that it's a conspiracy. Um, and the the people, I can't really say any more without without sort of you know that, that reaching itself, con contempt contempt of court but certainly if you look, if you look at other examples of, of wokeism with the SNP so uh, they accused Joanna Cherry so Joanna Cherry's a SNP uh, politician she was on the front Quite bench close to Sam, uh, yeah. yeah yeah and she's a she's a rival to to Sturgeon uh, certainly a threat to Sturgeon I mean Salmon was a threat to Sturgeon as well he was he was going to take a seat in Aberdeen and return to Holyrood to, to challenge Sturgeon that's why Sturgeon decided to you know change if Salmon's to be believed that's why Sturgeon decided to change the ministerial code to be able to prosecute him, to get him out of the way, uh, which certainly worked. And she's, you know, destroyed his reputation and destroyed his career as a politician. But um, yeah, Joanna Cherry, she was on the front bench. Um, she was, she's a rival to, to Sturgeon, you know, in, in the same party, in the SNP. Uh, so Sturgeon accused her of transphobia to, to get rid of her and, you know, got her off the, the front bench. Um, is, Cherry a transphobe? I mean, I doubt it. She's a she's a long-standing feminist and a lesbian. She doesn't seem like the most uh, you know stereotypically um, intolerant person to me. But you know, these, in these feverish times, you know, you can in these febrile times, you can just accuse someone of racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, and and get rid of them. Yeah, I mean, one thing I sort of because I mean the trans thing has really caused problems for the SNP over the past year or so. Um, and I, I, I sort of say, I, I haven't got a grin down, so I can't quote it, but there's, there's obviously a very prominent Scottish nationalist blogger called Wings Over Scotland, um, mm -hmm. who I believe is pretty much thrown in the towel now. But, but he did an article, and I was sort of paraphrasing, but the gist of it was, you know, we need to be pretty careful if we become independent, because the SNP and the Sturgeon are looking so authoritarian, God knows what they might do. I mean, do you think that's sort of putting more people off? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the splits within the movement are, are far more obvious than they were a few years ago. Uh, the weird thing is, it doesn't seem to be putting people off because the SNP are still fighting against, you know, the English who are seen as the colonialist oppressors in Scotland. People aren't thinking beyond that, and they're not seeing the reality that, you know, the SNP are the government in Scotland. They've been the government in Scotland for 14 years, uh, and 
yeah, it's, it's not it's not putting people off. Um, I, I receive, you know, certainly from the comedy community, I receive nothing. But uh, well, actually, no, I've got quite a lot of you know private messages of, of support. But um, you know, publicly, so many comedians denounced me for for standing against the SNP's hate crime bill. And the SNP's hate crime bill is really pernicious legislation that can be used as a tool. You know how the, the SNP have used wokeism you know, to, to get rid of Salmon, to get rid of Cherry. Under the hate crime bill, anybody, you know, I could say that you, you know, with something you said, I perceive that to be a hate, a hate crime, uh, you know, hate against me, you know, transphobic, whatever, whatever it is, because I'm identifying as non-binary right now. And I could have you prosecuted. And it's, it's, not a, it's not an idle threat. It's not, you know, a, it's not a diaphanous, you know, nebulous thing that could happen in the future. It's happening right now. If you look at Marion Miller, uh, she's a feminist who tweeted a ribbon, uh, a suffragette ribbon, tweeted a picture of a ribbon. And that was deemed uh, a transphobic hate crime because it could be termed, because number one, it's, you know, suffragette, so that's feminist, so that's transphobic. And number two, it's it's uh, it's a ribbon, so it could be fashioned into a noose. Uh, yeah. So How is I'm it? not. Bloody I swear hell. to God, I swear to God, like I'm not making this shit up. It's <laughs> fucking insane, and I can't believe people aren't out in the streets. You know, like I, I mean, it's going to reach. We're going to reach a tipping point, but I would have thought the tipping point would have been a while back. Yeah, and it's not. And bizarrely, I'm seen as a bigot for supporting Marion Miller, for saying, you know, we shouldn't be arresting people for tweeting a picture of a suffragette ribbon. <laughs> Even though I'm, I'm not I'm not a fan of the feminists, you know, they, they got the walk on girls at the darts band. You know what I mean? They've, they've never been, they've never been, you know, good to me. <laughs> so like, but I mean, I, you know, I just, I, I don't know, one of, the, one of the core things that I think we need to have in Western society is that nobody should have power over somebody else. Everybody should have a you know sovereign right to their own their own self. Um, you know whether that's you know you shouldn't have medical procedures. You should have choice over medical procedures that happen to you or, or whatever it is. Uh, nobody should have power over somebody else, or that power should be as minimal as possible. Well, that's, I'm so glad you mentioned um, kind of wokeism in comedy because that, that's the really interesting thing that's happened over the past. I mean, obviously, comedy is still very left wing. Um, and but but there are now some quite prominent exceptions. Um, so I'm thinking of people like Owen Constantine Christie, who I had on the show before. You know, trigonometry. He's, he's not really a he's not really a comedian though. He does that um, podcast. Yeah, um, but, uh, trigonometry, which has just been a, a runaway success. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there do seem to be a few people breaking the mold. I mean, what, what, there's that pro Brexit guy. What's his? So there's uh, there's Jeff Norcott. That's who I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and, and he's hilarious. You know, what I mean, people say, uh, you know, right wing comedy doesn't work, and it's like, well, how come Jeff Norcott is like one of the best comedians in the UK right now? You know, what yeah. I mean, it obviously works. One of the other, one of the things. I mean, there's there's a few prominent right wing comedians. There's Simon Evans, who's always been, you know, kind of right wing, but I think now he's, you know, feeling more emboldened to to reveal more of his opinions. Uh, there's Jeff. Obviously, there's me. There's um, Nick Dixon, maybe Tanya Edwards, Mary Barker, certainly slightly heterodox. But you know, the comedy industry is overwhelmingly left wing, and certainly I've been I've been told you know there's there's people who've you know openly blacklisted me because yeah. um, you know because I'm, I'm right wing because I said I voted Tory that means that I'm a bigot and a racist and that means uh, I you know shouldn't be allowed to work. Um, so it's, it's materially affected my income. Yeah. You know, people think cancel culture cu culture is a myth and it's absolutely not. I've been canceled by people and it means you make less money. And you also, um, I mean, it's unpleasant having people, you know, your colleagues denounce you on social media as a right-wing demagogue and things like that, you know, because I don't want feminists to be arrested for having a, for tweeting a picture of a ribbon, you know what I mean? If, I, if I'm a Nazi, if I'm a Nazi, I think if Hitler came back and saw me, he'd be like pretty disappointed with the state of modern Nazis. You know? Nazis have gone really downhill. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what I find so strange about it is what's woke changes so regularly. I mean, 
well, you mentioned this earlier, but you know, but what's woke now and what's woke in 10 years' time would probably be completely different. And some of the yeah. people who are considered to be very woke and right on now will probably be cancelled in 10 years' time. But it just seems yeah. completely arbitrary, and, and there's no real kind of exception to this difference in times, and um, you kind of have to fit into that. But I mean, one thing I wanted to, to bring up, so obviously we're talking about comedy, um, and it's, it's, it's something that Constantine mentioned to me I spoke to him, he, he, he's literally had agents in London or comedy clubs that just won't book him now. And that sounds quite similar to what you've had. I, I yeah. mean, is, is that like quite widespread in the industry or is this just like a few people on the side? Um, it's, it's quite widespread. So nobody <laughs> wants protesters at their comedy club. I think once you're at a certain point, once you're big enough, you're sort of, you know, if you're Ricky Gervais, if you're Bill Burr, then you're at the size where you're doing your own shows and you're, you're sort of, um, the controversy is a selling point. It's going to sell more tickets. Yeah. Uh, somebody, somebody my size, I'm, I'm going around doing the clubs. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not doing tours of my own show and pulling in, you know, hundreds of people. Uh, I'm just doing regular club nights. So the promoter's putting me on. At some some point, and I'll, I'll I'll kill it. I'm not I'm not going to lie. I'm one of the, I'm one of the best club comedians over like you know 20 30 minutes. I'll I'll totally kill any club. You know, the headline all all the big clubs. They're not all picking up the phone to me now, but like, in the past I've headlined all the big clubs, and you know I I can totally do it. Um, and now yeah now now it's changed. Yeah. I mean, yes, I say it's obviously a much bigger issue of freedom of speech. I mean, we were talking just off camera about the battle in Spain by election. Yeah. Um, and obviously, one of the things that happened shortly before the by election is a teacher showed, I mean, not, not he wasn't trying to be offensive or provocative, it was just in a lesson. He showed a cartoon of the Muslim Prophet Muhammad, uh, and he's been in hiding since. His family's been in hiding since. There's an investigation, but I think it found he, he did nothing wrong. But that, just no one seems to be talking about that as an issue at all. Um, I mean, yeah. the, the National Education Union, which you think should stand up for teachers, has completely shut up. Like according to one media report, they even tried to stop a different union raising it as a subject. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, kind of how, how have we got to this point where it's just like a non-issue that someone's being threatened by you know, religious fundamentalists? Well, I mean, it's, it's a strange situation to be in, but um, for some reason, the, the woke liberal left uh, paint Muslims as you know, eternal oppressed minorities. Um, so, you know, nothing, they, they're beyond criticism. Any criticism of them is Islamophobic. Um, and that means that, you know, misdeeds such as grooming gangs and trying to kill school teachers, um, nobody wants to say anything. Because as soon as, you, as soon as you say anything about grooming gangs or, you know, Muslims trying to kill school teachers, that labels you as a bigot and an, is, as, a, as an Islamophobe. Um, so yeah, they're not going to, you know, it's what is one of the, it's one of those issues that no woke liberal is going to touch. It's, it's like with the, you know, Trump mentioned the, um, the theory of the Wuhan lab leak. Yeah. And the scientists knew it had merit, you know, they knew it was a valid theory and more evidence is coming to light. The evidence is, you know, creating a, you know, it's, it's breaking down the sort of dam of, uh, of wokeism that's holding back the truth. Um, but it turns out, you know, we're pretty sure now that Trump was right, but the scientists, yeah. they're on the BBC World Service, are saying that we couldn't, we couldn't say that Trump was right because, you know, he's, he's Trump and he's using it for evil political uh, gains. Yeah. So, I mean, by criticizing Muslims for, for Batley or grooming gangs or anything like that, uh, people feel that they're aligning themselves with, you know, Jada Franson or someone yeah. like that. I mean, the Wuhan thing's fascinating, as in, um, kind of in terms of like modern censorship. Because up until about two months ago, um, if I if I'd had you on this channel saying that, theoretically, my channel would get deleted. Um, <laughs> so it was when I, I, I guessed on, I had to say, well, let's talk about something else. So let's, you know, do you watch the football last night, sort of? Thing. Yeah, which ironically, you know, hap has been happening over you know the last couple of decades with uh, yeah. with China. If you you mentioned China, if a Chinese person mentions Tiananmen Square, yeah. They, you know, our internet connection gets deleted and it's, it's funny how quickly we turn into china you know? yeah. and it's scary how many like major western corporations just bend over backwards i mean i mean like those ones that um 
I, I can't remember exactly which was, but it, 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 I think it was, it was one of the main England football clubs, something like Arsenal or someone like that. One of their um, players tweeted something about the, the Uyghurs, what's happening to them, which is just horrendous. It's, you know, it's probably the biggest mm. human rights abuse going on in the world. Um, and, and obviously, you know, Arsenal are you know, very much behind the BLM, the take the knee. But someone tweets about the Uyghurs, that pisses off the Chinese. And then the, you know, the football club actually issued an apology. I, I should say, I'm not 100% sure it was Arsenal. I know it's one of the big London yeah. clubs. Um, but yeah, you just it's always kind of like it's corporate power mixed in with um, Chinese state power is kind of really quite pernicious. Mm. Um, yeah. The, the, the other thing you said was so what, what, what was it? Which, oh, but that I mean, the thing that also really annoys me. So I'm on, on a bit of a rant. <laughs> it sort of seems to be completely shitting all over um, like liberal and progressive Muslims. Um, because w- when you've got someone like Jeremy Corbyn calling Hamas his friends, I mean, Hamas are basically, yeah. they're the far right. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, would be, it would be like um, sort of a, a left-wing Muslim politician becoming friends with the BNP because they share a dislike of mainstream Islamic civilization or something. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, just, it just shits all over Muslim feminists, Muslim liberals, people yeah. of left religion. And I just find it weird that it's not more backlash, that, that people don't... Um, See, this is just an absurd position where you've got people that in, in the West who are, say, very progressive are allying with some of the most right wing, in the worst form of the word, um, like kind of like far yeah. right bigots in the world. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the left, the woke liberals of the left who are overwhelmingly white uh, sometimes forget that, you know, the, the main victims of uh, Islamophobia are Muslims. Uh, sorry, the main. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. I should. I mean, uh... <laughs> I think I know where you go. <laughs> what? What an insight! You know what I mean? But like, I mean, I mean... <laughs> I'm so glad I put this interview. I'm not going to. That's what it means. If there's, uh, if there was, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking, you know, like uh, I might say something that would need to be cut out because it's too contentious. <laughs> Turns out there's some that might need to be cut out because it's too stupid. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, the, the main, you know, the main uh, perpetrators of, uh, you know, intolerance against Muslims are other Muslims. Yeah. So I mean, like my brother, my brother lives in Glasgow. Uh, his local um, offline, uh, not offline, it's a grocery shop, uh, was run by oh, I've forgotten the name. It starts with A, like, but it's a very sort of um, integrationist. A tolerant sect of Islam, yeah. Um, and uh, so this this guy who ran ran the, the grocery shop tweeted his customers or texted his customers saying, you know, Happy Easter or something like that. And so some hardcore Muslims jumped in a car in like the Midlands or something and drove up and killed him because he because he you know he was like integrating. It's like man, that's the sort of stuff we need to encourage. We need to yeah. encourage the sort of reformation and the modernization. And the you know increase. I mean, I hate to sound like a bigot, but we need to increase tolerance. Yeah. Like you know, and yeah, heard, to the left. That a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Because I, I think I remember that case. Yeah, it was an awful, awful case. Just made yeah, yeah. sense. Yeah, you won't have read about it in the Guardian, but um, <laughs> but yeah, if, if you're reading a proper newspaper, you would have you would have read about it. The Guardian, by the way, is so like it's, it exemplifies the sort of partisanship and the you know how you know white. Western liberals have, have jumped behind uh, hardcore Islamists to, you know, as a, as a sort of wedge to push against, you know, what they see as like imperialism and colonialism and all the rest of it, and you know, white privilege and all the rest. Um, I mean, the, the Guardian ran an article last year that really uh, rankled with me. They uh, ran an article saying that um, stats showed that uh, that uh, grooming gangs were a myth. But you know, Pakistani Muslim grooming gangs were a myth, and actually, uh, the stats showed that white people, you know, were were overrepresented as you know grooming gangs. And it's like we're in a country that's eighty six percent white. Obviously, there's going to be you know more than fifty percent of grooming gang men- members across the country are going to be white. That's what you'd expect. But the fact is that you know Pakistani Muslims were overrepresented. You know, as a you know proportion of that. I mean, I don't know what proportion of the population um, Pakistani Muslim, Pakistani Muslims, Muslim men are, but it's, it's a lot smaller than, you know, white people. Uh, so they weren't, they weren't looking at the representation. They weren't looking at the proportionality. 
And I thought for them to try and, you know, sweep it under the carpet after everything that's been said and everything that's come out, for them to still be trying to sweep it under the carpet and say, you know, oh, no, you're a, you're a bigot if you, if, you, if you notice this. I thought that was, that was disgusting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it seemed to be very, like, kind of localised. Like, it, it, there were sort of certain towns you'd hear a lot about. Um, and obviously the issue in that town wasn't totally divorced from race and religion. It was just well, obvious. Whereas in, like, rural Cornwall, you know, it probably was. You've got completely de different demographics. And, and when, when you lump them, yeah. you get a um, quite a misleading picture. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of unfortunate in a way that, all the you know everything happened to to make grooming gangs happen because you had uh, you know these young girls in care uh, that nobody you know society just you know looks down on you know the white underclass they're still like white underprivileged people are still the you know the most underperforming um, class of society uh, there's a report out today that, that that was saying that as well but Trevor Phillips been saying it for for like fifteen years. Um, so, you know, nobody's paying attention to every, you know, all the social workers, all the, you know, everybody sees them as, uh, as the underclass and as, as subhuman. And then you've got these men uh, who have this uh, culture where, you know, you can't, um, you can't have, you know, casual sex or whatever with, with women from your own culture. But these other women, these, you know, <laughs> infidels, are whores and you do whatever you like and uh, and these men were in positions where they're in contact with with those girls you know they're, they're taxi drivers uh, and you know working in the nighttime economy and all the rest of it so i mean it was the perfect storm for for that time but it's this am you know not just in rotherham but in so many so many different towns you know oxford uh, and all, all over the country um and there is a there is a sort of racial um, cultural element to that if you know the ethnic, ethnicities were reversed everybody would be up in arms and um, so the fact that they're seen you know because they're white because they're because they're class they're seen as subhuman and um, that's a you know that's a that's a horrific element to it and I can't believe people I can't believe I can't believe woke white liberals are fine with it I can't believe they're not upset about it and want to fix it I mean just one final question um, I mean do you think things are getting better or worse um, I mean, I think all our problems are because uh, Western societies have moved into a sort of period where, you know, economically, you know, we've done away with a lot of poverty and, you know, poverty and, you know, starvation. Starvation is a thing of the past in the West. Um, a lot of people have, you know, really good lives. Um, we've got a huge middle class. So we've moved into a period where, you know, there's no struggle anymore. Yeah. Um, so because we're in a post-struggle society, people are looking around to find problems. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've, we've got this big sword that we used to, it's like civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights. Yeah. And now we've still got this big sword and we're like, what can we fight next? <laughs> ah, you're a bigot. Ah, you're a racist. Ah, white privilege, you know? Yeah. So okay. I think we're making a lot of the problems for ourselves. But we really need to move to a society where we've got true equality and true tolerance and nobody has power over anybody else. And I can just see us storing up more problems for the future. The stuff I see, you know, my friends that are teachers in schools, uh, they're sending me materials and, you know, information about what the kids are getting taught. They're getting taught about critical race theory. So little kids, kids aren't racist. You know, I mean, nobody's born a racist. Kids are getting taught, oh, you're white, so you're privileged. Ah, oh, you know, he's not privileged. You should hate each other. You know, that's the subliminal thing. Ah, oh, look, look, you're, you're not white. That means that you're not privileged. He's privileged, you know. Like, that's not a healthy thing to, that's not, putting those divisions between kids. Kids don't see those, those, those problems. Just let, just let kids be kids. And like, you know, when they, when they grow up and go to some shit university that used to be a polytechnic and study gender studies, then they can fill their minds with that shite. You know what I mean? And then graduate with loads of debt and work as an unpaid intern. And um, yeah. Well, so Lee, it's been so great to have you on um, and to learn that Islamophobia is bad for Muslims. That's definitely the line <laughs> I'm going to lead on. <laughs> God. Oh, God. Oh, God. oh, remember when I said it? Remember when I said it? Like, <laughs> like I was, you know, like I was fucking Nelson Mandela. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs>
I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to clip that. That's the only bit of Tintu that's getting released. The rest is getting released. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, 